Hello everyone, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the United States of America to Uzbekistan, Mr. Daniel Rosenbaum, is about to complete his mission in the country and hand over his duties. So, today's guest of Kalampar Uz is American Ambassador Daniel Rosenbaum. Hello dear Ambassador, uh, thank you for accepting our proposal to hold this interview. And uh, we were so glad that you, you would uh, spare some time for us and uh, our questions will not be left un unanswered. And we have several questions for you in, in terms of uh, topical issues uh, which are interests of all media outlets in Uzbekistan. So my first question is that uh, what can you say about the international image of Uzbekistan before and after your assignment to the post as Ambassador Extraordinary and uh, Plenipotentiary of the USA to Uzbekistan? Uh, well, first of all, I think, um, first of all, I want to thank you for this interview. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, on the question about Uzbekistan's international image, there's no doubt that its image has improved quite a bit in the last six years under President Mirziyoyev. Um, frankly, I'm not sure it has that much to do with my being here, because it's all because of steps that have been taken by Uzbekistan itself to uh, institute reforms. Um, I think there's been a lot of attention paid, I've noticed, to international uh, in indexes and reports. And I just want to point out that, that that can be a good thing, but sometimes not such a good thing. It's a good thing because it does give you some standard and some goal to aim towards to improve things, whether it's on uh, the business environment. The World Bank, for example, has its doing business report. And Uzbekistan's position in that report has increased, uh, has improved quite a bit. Um, Transparency International has a corruption report they do every year and they rank countries. So it, it can be good. The bad side of it, though, is that sometimes those reports really focus on what I would call superficial things. For example, you need to pass a certain law that says X, Y, and Z. But we often see that just passing the law is not enough. It's, if it's not implemented, if it's not followed, it doesn't really change anything. So this focus on the sup more superficial things can sometimes be, be a problem. And then the other thing that's a problem I, that I've observed over time, not just here in Uzbekistan, but internationally, is that when you then see some uh, shortcoming, some problem, instead of fixing it, you just paper it over or you put white paint, you put a coat of white paint. I mean, we all know the, uh, about the famous Pachomkin village, right? Yes. And uh, unfortunately, that's, there's too much of that that happens in the world in response to this sort of question about image. So um, there, again, as I said at the beginning, there's no doubt there's been an improvement in the image uh, in the last six years, even in the last three years. But um, it's, it's, it's fragile. What I mean by that is uh, there's an old saying uh, that I think was uh, attributed to one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the U.S. founding fathers. He once said, it takes many good deeds to build a good reputation. All it takes is one bad deed to destroy it. And so, that, so I think Uzbekistan, too, needs to be careful about that problem of focusing so much on image as opposed to the, the substantive changes. Thank you. Uh, we can see that uh, the many countries all over the world are facing some security issues. Uh, my question is that to what extent can the United States of America contribute to maintaining security in Central Asia uh, at a time uh, when the world is dividing into two poles as it was in uh, Cold War period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean the issue of security in yes. this region is very important to us and very central to our foreign policy here. And as a result, we, uh, there's, I think there's a lot we can do uh, working with countries in the region, including Uzbekistan, to enhance security. The first thing we can do, and what we have done, it's not just what we can do, it's what we're doing, is to regularly have a dialogue and consult at the political level so that our policies are synchronized. Um, a good example of this is Afghanistan, where we've had a, just a continual ongoing dialogue with Uzbekistan about policy towards Afghanistan and have managed to find common ground and a common approach. And I think by do, continuing to do that throughout Central Asia, it will improve security. Another thing we can do and have done is to provide training and sometimes equipment to improve the capacity of 
Uzbekistan and other Central Asian countries' security forces. And of course, we only do that in response to requests. If we're asked for something, for some training or something, we can provide it. But what we found is that the countries of Central Asia uh, really want that. They're, they're very interested in receiving the benefit of our um, uh, experience, of our uh, expertise in security. So um, anyway, I, I think there's lots we, we have done and will continue to do to enhance security. And it, it, you, know, you mentioned the uh, political environment or the geopolitical environment in the world. Uh, we can continue doing this regardless of that. You know, because the countries of Central Asia have made clear that they want many partners. They don't want to just depend on one partner for their security. They want to um, diversify, and the United States is part of that diversification. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's uh, focus on some I international issues or events. Uh, like, uh, how much does the conflict in Eastern Europe and Taiwan and Uzbekistan's position in it, uh, on it? affect the relations between Uzbekistan and the United States of America? So, um, you know, again, what we've managed to do successfully in recent years is to establish a good dialogue and regular consultations with Uzbekistan on all of these regional and international issues of security. Um, and so we, we plan to continue to do that so that we understand each other's positions. That's really the important thing. And we find when we do that, that we have more in common than we have different or that, you know, that divides us. Um, so for example, in terms of some of the conflicts you mentioned, um, we share our perspective about those conflicts. Uh, our positions are well known with respect to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for example, some of Ch uh, China's recent actions in the Taiwan Straits, which we feel are uh, uh, an over over response or overreaction to some uh, visits by U.S. congressmen to Taiwan, and where we would we believe that China's actions are a threat to security of the region in the Taiwan Straits. So we're very frank in expressing those views to our partners in Uzbekistan. They have their own position based on their national interests, their ge ge geographical position, their uh, economic and other interests. And uh, we, we try to get an understanding of each other. I think the, the key point I want to make is that both Uzbekistan and the United States care deeply about having a stable international order, stable and predictable. And anything that threatens that is a threat to Uzbekistan and the United States. And we also both care deeply about the idea that countries should have their sovereignty, that there should be no threats to sovereignty. Sovereignty means countries get to decide for themselves how they want to act in the world. And I think that's, that's a very precious thing for the United States. It's also a very precious thing for Uzbekistan. Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, our questions are in different topics. Uh, next topic is related to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, to what extent do Uzbekistan's efforts to resume the economy and social life in Afghanistan conform to U.S. policy towards the new government of Afghan land? So, um, the policy um, towards Afghanistan is, as I said earlier, something that we consult often and in great detail with the government of Uzbekistan. This, goes, this predates even the withdrawal of U.S. troops last year. We, we very closely coordinated with Uzbekistan, and we view Uzbekistan as an extremely valuable partner when it comes to security in Afghanistan because it's a neighbor. It has a lot of visibility on what's happening there, et cetera. What we've, uh, what we've found in the past year is that our positions are very close to each other. Um, both of us believe that Afghanistan must not become a platform for terrorism. It should not again be a haven for terrorist groups, which is what happened in the 1990s and led to 9-11 and lots of other bad things in the world. Um, we both agree that the government that forms there now should be an inclusive government that represents the society, not just one narrow group. And we both really emphasize, and I know this is true very much of the government of Uzbekistan because we talk to them about it, the need for human rights and especially the rights of girls and women in Afghanistan to be respected by the authorities there. Though we agree on all those things, sometimes our approach to the government, to the current regime that's uh, in power in Afghanistan may, may differ slightly. And I think that's really explained by the fact that Uzbekistan has, is a neighbor 
Uzbekistan has to have a good relationship with whoever is in power there. And also, if Uzbekistan has very understandable interests in building Afghanistan as a, a bridge, you might say, to South Asia. That's yes. something that's been made clear to us by the president and others here. They see a long-term goal of having you know, much trade and transportation go through Afghanistan. So we understand all of that, and that sometimes means our approach will be slightly different, but our basic goals and objectives, I think, are the same. And that's the most important thing. Thank you. Uh, you know, our uh, government, our country is uh, implementing the projects of new rep reforms in the country. And will high-level cooperation with the United States ensure the sustainability of uh, reforms in Uzbekistan? So I would say what will ensure sustainability of reforms yes. is the strong, continued strong political commitment from the highest levels of the government of Uzbekistan, a continuation of the approach that Uzbekistan has taken over the past five or six years, which I would characterize as an approach of the reforms being comprehensive, covering not just economic areas, but social and political as well, and also an approach of being open to uh, advice and technical assistance from the world, from the international community. So um, what we have done, uh, the United States has done, is to try to support the reforms as long as that approach continues, which it shows every sign of, of doing, through providing aid, technical assistance, exchanges, expertise. Um, so I think that that's the key to sustainability of reform, is continuing to that course. Thank you. Uh, President Shavkat Mirziyoyev often states that the current reforms are irreversible. What do you think? Hasn't there really been a reversion in the reforms? So. Um, when the president says that, and he has, I've heard him say it many times, uh, I take that as a, a declaration of political commitment on his part, not necessarily as a prediction or an observation. He's not saying it will just happen because it will happen, but he's saying it, you know, it, it's because I'm committed to it. So um, the, the, the unfortunate truth is, if you look at the experience in the world um, and through history, reforms are reversible, right? Because the reforms are started by a political leader, hopefully with support from the citizens and report, uh, support from different institutions of society. Um, and that means they can be reversed by political leaders with or without support from citizens. And, you know, there's so many examples, I, I, I won't even start trying to list them, but, you know, I think of a country like Myanmar or Burma, which not too many years ago was very much on the path to reform and people saw it as a great example. And then it's completely reversed 180 degrees to become one of the, arguably one of the most repressive countries in the world. So it can be reversed. What will hopefully avoid that is again, continued political commitment at high levels and also um, help from international partners. Um, and uh, as I said before, we'll continue to provide that help to your last point about whether reforms have actually, are, are, you said are, maybe they're already being reversed, um, I, I think it depends on which sector you're looking at. I think there are some sectors where reform has gone along well, others where it may be stalled and just not moving, and others where maybe we've seen some reversals. So it's a mixed picture. What measures by the government of Uzbekistan during especially your tenure do you consider the main factors in strengthening and guaranteeing relations between the two countries, between Uzbekistan and the United States of America? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, um, the key during my time here to strengthening our relations has been, um, going back to something I said earlier, has been this attitude and approach by the government of Uzbekistan to our relationship. In other words, they um, we can discuss any topic, no matter how difficult or, or sensitive. Um, there's a lot of openness on both sides and, and willingness to accept criticism and, and, and um, open discussion. And, um, and there's a basic sharing of values and goals. And I think that's, that's the key to any successful relationship. Um, we want to see the reform succeed, for example. Of course, the government of Uzbekistan wants to see the reform succeed, so we, we share a goal. We both want stability in Central Asia. We want good security and you know fight terrorism and other threats to that security. We share that goal, and 
that's why the relationship is successful. So that's, that's what I think I would point to as the kinds of approaches that have ensured progress during my time here as ambassador. Thank you. Uh, what are the main conclusions on the future policy by the U.S. side in the process of regular contact with Central Asian countries, in, in particular Uzbekistan? One conclusion is that more cooperation at the regional level is good for everyone. Um, so, for example, um, the C5 plus one format, which we have been engaged in for the last seven years, I think we started in 2015. Um, Uzbekistan has actually gone from being just a participant to, I would argue, and uh, we've seen that having regular meetings of experts, co cooperating on regional projects together, like projects related to trade and transport, for example, are, are paying off for the region, not just because it increases uh, you know, jobs and prosperity for people, but also because it allows each of the Central Asian countries to be stronger in their relationship with the rest of the world. And they can kind of stand up for their own interests and rights better when they're when they have trust with each other. So we, we've encouraged that trend. Um, if you look at the summit of uh, leaders that happened in Issaquul just last month in, in July, it's another indication that that process is gaining momentum and, and has a lot of support. Um, so I think that, you know, I'd point to the C5 plus one. I'd also point to the uh, a shared sense that sovereignty and independence are really important values that have to be protected. Um, these are things that um, you know, are kind of indicators of, of, uh, of success and common interests in Central Asia. Um, thank you. Uh, in its annual reports, the U.S. State Department uh, discusses the situation with uh, freedom of expression, uh, the media, uh, journalists and bloggers, human rights, terrorism and extremism in Uzbekistan. Uh, as a person who is aware of the situation inside the country, uh, how do you assess the original situation? In Uzbekistan. Yeah, so um, the, you mentioned the annual reports. Yes. Um, I want to just men emphasize that uh, sometimes those reports focus so much on what happened in the previous year that they might lose sight of the relative change over time, uh, which is something I've been able to see here, being living here and being on the ground. Um, so uh, those reports are written according to a certain format, and, and they have to be written that way because actually they're required by, uh, by law in the United States. Congress passed a law that says these reports are, are mandatory. So they're, they're factually true, factually accurate, but sometimes they don't give the full picture of the relative change. So with respect to the relative change, I, I think it's, there's no question that the situation um, with respect to the things you mentioned, um, whether it's human rights, whether religious freedom, trafficking in persons, uh, other things, has, has improved in some cases significantly in the past five or six years. Um, there's been especially no marked progress in religious freedom and trafficking in persons, the last two things I mentioned. If we had more time, we could get more into the details of that, but we've been very impressed with the commitment of the government to make improvements in that area. We've tracked it very closely, and while there are still some shortcomings, there's still some things to work on, there has been significant progress. In other areas, we've seen, um, I've seen in my time here, some two steps forward, one step back, or maybe sometimes two steps forward, two steps back. Um, and I would just mention a couple of things in that respect. One is uh, in the media, in the area of media and uh, the freedom of uh, journalists to report on anything. Um, I do think that there, are, and I've said this before publicly, I think that there are some red lines that still exist that people know not to cross. And so that, that's essentially a form of self-censorship that comes into play. I think there's also uh, still too much harassment of certain journalists and bloggers who are too aggressive in their reporting. And we know of cases of people being detained or falsely accused of various crimes maybe sometimes even uh, sentenced to prison. And uh, there's not a huge number of those cases, but even a few sends a message to other journalists, and that's a bad thing. So, so that's one area where we've seen where the progress has, there's been progress, but it, it, it hasn't gone far enough. 
Um, and I'd also say that with respect to things like the treatment of detainees in prisons and so on, a lot of progress, but we still get cases and reports of, reports of torture, abuse, and bad treatment. It's not a systemic problem as it used to be, but there are still issues that have to be dealt with. So, but um, the progress has been, in some cases, slow, in some cases, not far enough. And uh, actually, one more that I didn't mention, which I think is important, is uh, civil society and the ability of non-governmental organizations to um, be created and to operate. It's still too difficult for organizations to get registered or to stay, in, stay operating. And um, this is something that needs to be addressed uh, through policy. Mm, thank you. Uh, very special question. Uh, can we look forward to the visit of the U.S. President Joe Biden in uh, Uzbekistan as a symbol of uh, strengthening and uh, coordinating ties between two countries? Well, as I sit here today, I can't report plans for a President Biden visit, unfortunately. Uh, uh, there, I have no news of that. But I will say that there's been, in my three years here, a steady stream of uh, very high-level visits um, in both directions, actually. You know, we've had, in, just in my time here, the Secretary of Commerce was, came, the Secretary of State came, our Deputy Secretary of State, uh, the Commanding General of our Central Command, or CENTCOM, has come a couple of times. And um, in the other direction, there's also been similarly a lot of high-level officials. And as you say, I think this is a symbol. Uh, it's, it, it has practical advantages, but also symbolically, it's a, it, it shows um, the strategic level of our relationship right now. So um, I expect that trend to continue, and, um, and I hope we'll continue to get a lot of senior level visits in both directions. Uh, thank you for your answers. And I have only one question left, and uh, that's open question. Um, as a person who is leaving the position uh, you have been working for many years, uh, what, can you, uh, what kind of concluding uh, thoughts or opinions can you tell us about Uzbekistan, Uzbek people, and your memories here? Well, we could, we could talk for another hour about that, <laughs> but we don't have an hour because uh, I have a lot of impressions, a lot of uh, memories of my time here, almost all of them extremely positive. Uh, I will say that what I'll miss the most about the country is the people, um, because the people of Uzbekistan are incredibly generous and warm and welcoming. Uh, I've been welcomed everywhere in the country. I've traveled all over the country, yes. always welcomed enthusiastically and with great uh, spirit, uh, strong spirit. And I, um, I'll, that's what I'll remember the most, is those interactions with people. Um, I think this country has incredible potential, really great potential. It's a young country, very young population. We all know that. I think it's the last I heard something like 60% of the population is 30 or under, which is remarkable if you look at across the world. And that means potential, intellectual potential, um, economic potential is, is very strong. But what's needed, and I think the leadership of the country recognizes this, is to improve institutions that will ensure that young people get a good education, that they have access to good jobs, and that the country adopts the most modern, advanced technology and, and knowledge so that those jobs will be good ones that, you know, can, that will have an impact in the world. So um, there's been progress on that goal, but it's still a long way to go. I just want to note, actually, I, I can't help brag a little bit about what the U.S. is doing here, that when I talk about education, this is an area where we have devoted a lot of attention and resource. We're working closely with the Ministry of Public Education and, and the Ministry of Higher Education. We have exchange programs. We're trying to help give opportunities for studying at U.S. universities. We also are, are working on English language instruction. We've trained 15,000 English teachers here in Uzbekistan in the past three years uh, to improve their level so that they can be better teachers. So, um, so we recognize what an important investment that is, that education is the key to any country's success, and especially Uzbekistan. So, so I'll leave with, with a feeling good about that, uh, but mostly, as I said, feeling good about um, what I've seen, what I've experienced here, and especially the people of your country um, who are your greatest resource. Uh, thank you for your answers, and we hope another uh, friendly conversation with you in our editorial office.
And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My, my pleasure.